Mr. Nando Gutierrez. I, along with other people, do some communications and marketing and strategy for Dash, which is a different cryptocurrency to Bitcoin, but it's based in Bitcoin and it has some similarities and differences that I would like to introduce today to all of you, so maybe I'm able to get some of you into the community. After the presentation, it will be, it will be quite short, 20, 30 minutes, we'll try to connect with the uh, lead developer, Evan Duffield, through Skype. Q&A will be much better if he can answer the, the real technical questions if there is anyone who wants to go there. So first thing I usually get asked when I talk about that is why not Bitcoin? I've been into Bitcoin before that being into Dask, I've, I'm sure like many of you have talked to friends about Bitcoin a lot and I've been really abrasive about that. And then when I talk about Dask now, they say, why well, you change your mind? And my answer is, there are several reasons. In fact, I, I haven't really changed my mind. I think Bitcoin is great, but it's not the only, uh, the only answer. First thing is that Bitcoin is not perfect. Bitcoin is great. Protocol is amazing. The, the level of vision that Satoshi Nakamoto had when he designed the protocol is simply outstanding. But he, he wa it was impossible to think for him to really know where Bitcoin was going to go and what were the challenges it was going to face. Uh, so there are certain areas in which Bitcoin has flaws. Uh, some of them are obvious flaws that everybody agree, agree there are flaws. And in other areas, maybe it's up for discussion if it's a flaw or it's a feature, but that uh, brings me to the second reason why, why not Bitcoin, because people have different needs. Things that are great for some people in Bitcoin may be a problem for others. Privacy, first of all, like um, it was said before, Bitcoin is not private, everything is public, and that is fine for many people, and it may be a big problem for others. And finally, Monopolies are bad. As well as you don't want a world in which you can only browse the internet with Internet Explorer, you don't want a world in which we, you want to take out the, the current system only with Bitcoin. You need comp we need competition, you need innovation, and for that, you need different people doing different things so uh, we can uh, achieve something. And now, <coughs> let's go into that. That's first, first thing to know is a Bitcoin fork. So uh, this means that the code is based on, on the Bitcoin code. This has many advantages because adoption is much easier because many of the infrastructure developments that have, have already been done can be reused for DAS with not a lot of coding. And uh, the big difference is that uh, DAS has introduced uh, <coughs> structural innovation in the, in the network that allow us to build on top of that uh, specific features that uh, solve these problems uh, I was seeing on them before. The, the network obviously has users like everyone, like every network. Then we have miners, like the Bitcoin miners, they keep ledger, this is a proof of work coin, so miners are still there. And then we have masternodes, which is DAS take on Bitcoin nodes. They are uh, Bitcoin nodes with more functions and some different requisites, so uh, they can do more things. And this is the structural innovation that uh, we build upon uh, all those features. So masternodes. Masternodes are servers that anyone can run that perform certain services for the network. There are two characteristics that are really important and that we'll see later why. <coughs> the first one is that they receive part of the block reward and, uh, as a payment. In Bitcoin, only miners are paid. All the block reward goes to the miner. In, in DAS, master nodes also get paid. This has a great advantage, is that you can ask master nodes for many things because they are getting paid. In, in Bitcoin, uh, node owners are volunteers, they don't get paid, they, they, they finance the node themselves, so uh, they will only go to a certain way, to a certain, to a certain extent. Uh, and that's, that's a problem. Uh, Bitcoin right now has, I think it's 6.6K 6 .6 nodes with a market cap of uh, 3.5 billion. 
DAS has less than 1% of that market cap, and we have a 2.6K uh, masternodes. So we are almost uh, half of their number of nodes with just le like half percent of, of the market cap. And the second important characteristic is that you need 1,000 DAS. Right now, that's about $3,000 to create a password. <coughs> you don't spend them. You don't give them to anyone. You keep that, the, those 1,000 DAS. But uh, you can't spend them. If you spend them, then your master stops working and you stop uh, getting payments. This is really important because we are going to build on top of master nodes uh, several features that require that you can trust on the master nodes as a group. So we can't uh, allow anyone to, to start master nodes because then someone could suddenly start 2,000 master nodes and uh, subvert the network. Uh, we, uh, the, this thousand dash website uh, um, avoids civil attacks, which is a type of attack in which the attacker puts many elements under his control in the network and then makes them work against the network to destroy it. This way, if you want to really control a big part of the master node, you are going to need to buy uh, most of the, mo of the coin supply. So uh, it doesn't make any sense for you, and it's extremely expensive. So first feature that we do with master nodes is privacy. As I said before, privacy is not the same as anonymity, but um, I won't go a lot into, into that. But Bitcoin is not private. Everything is public. Uh, it's pseudonymous. That's not the same as anonymous. Your address, even if you think no one knows, it can be known eventually, and your transactions are there forever in the blockchain. So maybe now someone can trace them, but it will be he will be able to do it in 20 years, and, and then all your past is there on the internet for for others to see. Uh, First place where it's obvious you can get tied people to their addresses and exchanges. And exchanges, first, they are uh, companies usually registered somewhere, so they could be subpoenaed for <coughs> for for the users and, and, and tied to their to their addresses. Then it's hackers. We see exchanges hack every day, so all the data they have could eventually uh, go out, and then. That place where you started with your fiat uh, into into Bitcoin uh, could be the start of a, a, a long string of, of traceability. So what does does is that when you want to to use the privacy or anonymity features, is uh, it splits the files into common denominations, and then by the way. You don't have to do this if you don't want. You can use it uh, completely, in a complete public way, like Bitcoin, but you have this option. So uh, when, you, uh, when you decide to do this, you split your funds in, well, the wallet does it for you. It splits the funds in common denominations. This means that uh, you get in one address 10 DAS, in another one, another 10 DAS, and another one 10 DAS. So it's easier to mix and confuse the blockchain, if, if you want to say it that way. And it, it's done ahead of time because many of the systems in which you mix coins with Bitcoin uh, today uh, require you to wait to make a payment for other users to be available. So you, you really never know when you can do the payment. With that, you do the mixing ahead of time and then you use the funds normally when you want to spend them. And the most important thing also is that it's done in a complete trustless way. The master nodes coordinate all the mixing, but the funds never leave your wallet. So there's no risk of someone living with your funds like it has happened a lot with the Bitcoin mixers uh, that people use for, for many reasons, that you send the funds and then they give you funds back and sometimes they have just disappeared and people have lost the funds. With uh, master nodes uh, mixing, that is not possible. So I'm gonna go uh, a bit in, in to detail into what mixing is. Before before doing that, I would like to explain in a completely off beacon with a completely off beacon example. Think that you are in a table with two other people and you three take out your wallets, 
take out the bills you have in the wallet, put them on, on the table, mix them, and then you take back the same amount of money you, you brought, but you don't know if it's your bills or someone else's bills. This is what mixing is. What mixing does is that you can never know where the funds came from. So uh, transactions don't disappear from, from the blockchain. You just don't know who's, who's the owner of, of everything. That's why it's, it's not pure anonymity that, like I said, things are not traceable. They are traceable, but you don't know what you are tracing if, if all these things have been done. So let's say, for example, user A, well, his wallet denominates uh, his funds into 10, 10, 1, 1. And those would be four addresses in his wallet. Then the second user would get 10, 10, 1 because he came with less funds. And the third user would get 10, 10, 1, 1, 1. Then when the funds are mixed, what we get is he has four different addresses. Each user has four different addresses. The user A, the red one, has addresses that are different to his. He has this, to the addresses he came in into the mixing session. He has the same funds, but now anybody knows what's the, who's the owner of the funds. The master node could know. That's uh, something we are going to change in the future. We are working on master node blinding, so not even the master node can trace what funds were uh, when. However, we solve this by chaining master nodes. You can mix up to eight rounds. So for someone to really be able to trace your funds, he would need to control the eight master nodes. And the probability of that is basically zero. With um, 2,600 master nodes, uh, for someone to control eight master nodes selected randomly, uh, with 1,000 master nodes, he would have like a, it's less than 1% of chance. It, it was like 0 0.000 something chance of really tracing one transaction. And once master node blinding is done, not even that. And anyway, no one has 1,000 master nodes. And uh, I mean, the, it's basically impossible to trace a transaction. We're talking probably this next to zero. You want to ask something? Yeah. Is this process by overwriting the same addresses, or is this generating randomly new addresses? It generates new addresses. And then uh, the master node, what the master node does is it creates a big transaction. So with it's reassigning the funds. Yeah. So you send it to yourself to mm -hmm. different addresses. So in the blockchain, you see different addresses, you know uh, who's, who's what. This is done in the wallet. Uh, so you can see over here, it, it's a, the, the dashboard okay. wallet is like the Bitcoin core wallet. It has a, a skin, but the, the functionality is quite similar. But we have this part, uh, which is which is different for us. Here you see the dark zone balance is the anonymized funds balance. You, we keep separate balances, so you can choose if you use your public funds or anonymized ones. When you want to, to mix funds, you just click here, and then it starts. Uh, it can start mixing those funds. Here, you see that I, I set a limit of 100 dash for anonymity at, at four rounds. You can select as many rounds as you want. And even if you wanted more anonymity after eight rounds, you could send it yourself and then do another eight rounds, and you, can, you could be doing that forever. And then when you want to send, it's super easy. You just need to click that send on the top of the wallet, and that transaction will use anonymous funds. And after that, after the presentation, if you want, I can show you a few examples in the blockchain so you can play with them and try to trace the, the funds and, and, and see if you can, you can get where they came from. The second uh, feature that we build on top of masternodes is instant transactions. Uh, Bitcoin transactions take a long to get confirmed. On average, it's 10, 10 minutes per, per block, but sometimes it gets up to an hour, sometimes it's three minutes. And the way some people are trying to solve this is uh, working on zero acceptance uh, policies and algorithms and trying to see if there's a double spend attack uh, and if not, then I'll accept. But this is not uh, a valid solution. Uh, right now, nobody's gonna do a double spend attack to buy for a coffee, to pay for a coffee, but in the future, if you, someone developed a wallet that could try to do a double spend, 
that only succeeded sometimes, that will launch two transactions at the same time, and let's see which one gets confirmed. And then by the time uh, the new block comes, the, the, the vet, he's out of the coffee shop, and maybe he gets one in every 20 coffees for free, but that's, that's a flaw. And payment processors can work on seeing that, and they work, but that, that's a flaw, and, and, and we think we found a way to, to solve that. The first thing that we do, uh, I'm going to explain how, how this instant transaction in, in, in does work. Let's say that user A sends a transaction, so he broadcasts it to the network, and then 10 master nodes randomly selected will check if there is a double spend <coughs> attempt by a data address. If there isn't, they will create what we call a lock, and that lock gets, gets added to the memory pool. And then the user B gets a confirmation that the transaction is valid. And then miners won't be able to include any transaction that contradicts that lock. So what we've done is that we've put the validation of the transaction in that second tier of the oh, network yeah. in, the, in, in the master nodes. And then the miners will mine the transaction anyway, but it's already valid and, and the lock has been emitted by, by the by the master. This way, we can do this much faster. All this process takes around four seconds. It's even faster than credit cards. And after the first confirmation, uh, which in DAS takes an average of a minute and a half, because blocks are 2.5 minutes, uh, then you can spend the funds. We require that at least the, uh, one, the, the transaction is mining one block, so you can spend it. So this gives huge convenience for day-to-day uh, -day usage of, um, of DAS. Also, it opens uh, new possibilities besides uh, paying uh, merchants and stuff like that in, in, for trading. Uh, you probably can't withdraw funds from an exchange instantly because to start with, they, they should happen in cold wallets and, and all the kind of things, but, uh, but you can deposit with instant transactions so your funds are avail available quite fast, and you can move the, the money around much faster. And then with, there we have also a few other ideas that we can implement on top of master nodes that uh, could be huge. First one is two-factor authentication in the world. Um, uh, we would uh, build it on. In fact, there is some coding done, but uh, we've put it in with a lower priority right now because there are other things that are being developed. But the master nodes would uh, coordinate the, the second factor. So you would have, uh, you could assign a one address in your wallet to uh, have a second factor in your phone. So any funds in that specific address uh, would need uh, the confirmation from your second signature in the phone uh, to, to be spent. This is basically what multisig is, but in a much easier way because multisig, as we said before, is, is not used right now. A tree blockchain, also, uh, with, uh, this is already being done. Uh, I, I'm not sure when it will be available, but it definitely will. Um, we've devised a way in which master nodes can keep uh, two versions of the, mass of, of, of the blockchain. One of them would be the full blockchain, which is useful for many reasons, for traceability and, and everything. But then there's like a trim version in which you only keep when the coin is created and where is it now. And you need to work in this, in, in, in this second blockchain in parallel because it changes all the time. But let's say that you have um, coins created and sent to, to user A, then he used that coin to pay to B, and then to C, and then to D, and then to E. Most users in the wallet, they don't need the full blockchain. They just need to know that the coins are in E. They don't need the other five transactions. So that tree version would only have A to E and would uh, erase all the other transactions for that uh, tree version that many wallets would use because you just need to uh, confirm that the funds are there and scan where the funds are. One question, why do you need A? It just only needs a last one. Yeah, that's uh, that's a question that you have to do to developer when when we connect to it. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, well, basically, yeah. What you say is that you would keep a record of all, all addresses with the with the balance. Yeah, makes sense. 
Well, for each of the coins, it makes sense to know where, when they were created. Uh, maybe you need age for anything. Well, we can ask him later. Uh, that's, that's above my pay grade, I'm afraid. And then there's also some thinking about the distributed word wallet, in which the keys are uh, split into different master nodes, so you can hack a web wallet. Uh, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be a web wallet like the ones we have now that are stored in the server. This one would have the keys split into different servers, so it would be uh, more difficult to, to hack, and it would be a great place for people to start, because right now, uh, let's face it, uh, wallets are a pain for most users, and uh, people who get into crypto sometimes get discouraged. Uh, because of, of the wallets we have. And then the feature to rule them all. Uh, this one I haven't put in, in present nor in, in future because it's been, this one is going to be launched in a couple of weeks probably. It was introduced uh, a few days ago, the, the specifications, and, and will, will happen very soon. With blockchain governance, what we are trying to do is give a solution to the permanent lack of funds for development of the project. Uh, that of the, of the cryptocurrency projects. Uh, most of the projects are based on, on donations, like Bitcoin is, like we were in the beginning. Uh, you ask people for money to support developers, but this model has failed. Uh, usually there was a foundation, we have one, I'm vice chairman, but uh, the amount of money you need to really develop a coin and make it competitive with uh, legacy systems it's impossible to get from users in a, a consistent way via donations. So the result is that most developers in most projects were there at the very beginning, and there's no incentive for new developers to get in and help develop the project. That's, in my opinion, one of the reasons why we have like 600 altcoins, because a developer has no economic incentive to get into Bitcoin. There are many reasons to go into Bitcoin, but not as direct as getting paid. And uh, like the amount of fines is very limited, so very few developers and, very, and a lot of difficulties to, to finance many of the projects. So what we've done is that we are gonna reserve the part of the blog reward, and that part of the blog reward is gonna go to an escrow account <coughs> that master nodes will control. No one can get these funds, only masternodes can decide what to do with them. And like I explained before, no one can control the masternode network because uh, of the 1000 DAS requirement. So in this way we can uh, be sure that the projects that, uh, well, that they control the funds and then there will be a website where people can submit proposals with a budget, proposals for the advancement for the advancements of, of that promotion or development or anything, and then the master who control that uh, that escrow account will vote on the proposals, and those who pass will get funded, and uh, this will be done in, in the final phase with no individuals intervention. The, the final stage in this is that people put the proposals, have to vote, and, and the mass notes vote, and then they get funded. Yeah? Uh, well, like, just if you think how markets normally work, like, who just all the master notes votes all the money for themselves? Like, that's what I would do if I were a master node, instead of giving them to developers. Like, yeah. if you're a miner, why don't you give them to developers, like, already? Well, uh, we had a similar problem in the beginning when we decided to split the block between miners and masternodes. In the beginning, we had no way to require the miner to give part of that reward to the masternode. So we just asked. And we got to a 95% compliance rate. Just asking. Then it was hard coded and now they can't not pay. And uh, masternodes are usually owned by people who are really into the coin. They are not people who get in and out fast because you need to set up the server and you need to know how to do it. 
uh, we've talked about ways to vet the proposals in some ways. We are still not sure if, if we want to do that or not. In the end, if the masternodes, who are the guardians of the coin, decide that they don't want more development and they, they pay back to themselves, first, I don't think they, they're going to do it. And I'm not sure if I want to prevent that or not. We are still discussing a few of these things because it would not make much sense uh, because maybe The, the amount we are talking about is 10% of the block. Masternodes right now get 42.5% of the block. They will get up to 50%. Miners will get 40, and, and this special scroll account controlled by masternodes for development will have 10%. I don't believe masternodes will want to, to kill development and advancement, and advancement of the coin. We'll have to see, and with time, decide if we want to put some controls also for other things like, I mean, yeah, there could be proposals that you would not want, not even get to a vote because they are stupid, because they are illegal, because they are many things. We need to still work on, on that things. We want to launch the first version in two, three weeks, and then after that we'll iterate. In the first version, for example, that is core account uh, will not be a, a, a pure account controlled by all masternodes probably will be a 10 or 15 multi-sig account of members in the community that will sign the transactions for the proposals that get funded. Then we'll go to a number of randomly selected masternodes signing the transactions and we'll, we'll, we'll move into that. But this requires a lot of coding that well, a big part of this is already in place. In fact, the introduction of this method was the first vote we had. Uh, it was passed a few weeks ago and uh, something like 72, 73% of the masternodes voted yes to, to, this, to this thing. The, there was like 0.5% that voted no, and the other, uh, the other 27, 28 was people who didn't vote. That's something that may happen, and I mean, they knew it was gonna pass, so they didn't bother. Or people who really don't want to be bothered, and they just want to collect the money from the payments the masternode gets, a masternode right now gets around a 13, 14% uh, annual return on the 1,000 coins, and you still keep the coins. Uh, you get paid in dash, obviously, so also you get the, the potential of increasing value if it goes up. Um, that's, that's all I had. Um, yeah. Do you have like some kind of plan to like reduce the amount of uh, dashes needed to run master master node? Like you, the theoretically, the price increases, like the cost of running the master node, like increases, like so that it becomes like uh, the group becomes like smaller, and more and more the master node runners like want to cash out their master node. Yeah, right, right now we are not thinking about that. Uh, in fact, uh, last summer the price was much higher. Uh, what that was about $15. So running Masternode was $15,000. And we didn't saw that. What we want to do is that running Masternode is something really hard and expensive because we don't want uh, people <coughs> running them for, for nefarious purposes. We want them to run them uh, because they believe in the coin and they want to work for the coin and they get paid for that. So what we have already seen is that people that don't have enough funds to run a masternode, they get together and they run a masternode together. There are already a few services in which uh, you, can, uh, you can do that and then you get paid according to your contribution to the masternode. If the masternode number felt a lot, uh, then I guess we should think about all kind of solutions. Uh, we were, we had around 1,000 master nodes with just a 10 percent uh, percentage of the block going to master nodes, and a much higher price. Then when the, uh, when then when we studied the, the probabilities of of the network being subverted, we realized that we wanted to be between the 2,000 and the 3,000 for statistical reasons. 
So we increase the, the reward and, and, ma and the, 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 master of mass the number of master nodes increase. We'll have to see, but I don't believe we're changing that anytime soon. So, so I wonder if you have a master node, what do I have to do? You have to buy 1,000 Dash. Which costs what right now? Around $3,000. Yeah. And then uh, you set up a server, uh, a small VPS uh, would work. Uh, it can cost 2 to $5 a month. You set up, there are many tutorials in, in our website and in our forum. You follow them. Uh, you keep your funds in your wallet, in your computer, but you tie it with the server, uh, with some uh, protocols, and then you, you run it, and then you get paid in your wallet. It's quite easy. Um, many people do do it without many apps. Uh, uh, and also, we have several people who run them for you if you want. There are people in the community who offer their services for a fee, and they run the remote part, the, the server part, and you keep your wallet in your computer. <coughs> so uh, they do everything there, and you just start it from your wallet, and you get the payments, and then you pay them whatever fee they are, they are charging you. It's, it's relatively easy, but you have to, to work with wallets and servers and that kind of thing. Um, who is going to be using this there? Sorry, who is going to be using this And do you think there's something like this can scale like, beyond kind of nefarious? Absolutely. Uh, our target is everyone. I, I don't believe that privacy is something only for, for criminals. Uh, there are many reasons why you want your transactions private. First is philosophical. I mean, when we know we are being watched, we act differently. If I know that somehow, sometime, someone is going to be able to trace that purchase of a sex toy, maybe I would buy it. Uh, second reason is security. <laughs> Uh, second reason is security. As I said, um, exchanges get hacked all the time, uh, wallets get hacked all the time, so it's, if it's more difficult to know how much you have, you are more secure. We already have read news about early, early Bitcoin adopters being blackmailed because people knew they had X amount of, uh, of dash, and, and that's a problem with, with, with full public ledger. Another reason would be governments, even if probably we we'll live in places where you can almost trust the government, uh, you don't know if that will be uh, the same in the future. So uh, they have the capabilities to really do deep blockchain analysis and, and, and know what you are doing. And then it's companies. I, I don't have a big problem with companies mining my data, but Truth is, they are going to be able to do it. They can profile you even if you don't do really the, the things that you may be ashamed of. Um, there was a story in a book I read, I think it was called Hab Hab Habit, The Power of Habit. I don't remember the, the, the specific name of the book, but there was an, an anecdote uh, that um, a guy from, I think it was Target, uh, explained after he left the company they started to mine all the data they had on their target card customers. So they reached a level of knowledge about the customers that scared them. There was a father that arrived to a store really younger because Target had sent his 15-year-old daughter a leaflet with offers for pregnancy products, and he was Enraged, and, and they said it should be a mistake. And then a couple of weeks after that, the, um, the father came to the store apologizing because apparently his daughter was pregnant and he didn't know, and she didn't know, but they had uh, profiled her because he was buying some type of creams and several type of products that uh, have made him know that she was pregnant with a big probability of success. After that, they decided to introduce some random noise in their uh, customized offers, so people didn't creep out for the level of success they, they were having. So, uh, for all those reasons, I believe that our target is everyone. And then, uh, instant <coughs> transaction is for everyone. I mean, if you pay coffee, the, 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 the merchant wants his funds available immediately. I, I just have a question about how to scale on the merchant side, because obviously 
obviously there's a lot more compliance there. So if they're accepting a dash and they have to then go to their compliance officer and say, this has been from a victim service, we're not sure who the end user is, with that kind of side, like, if people don't have somewhere to spend it because of that issue, like, how does it scale if it's not? Well, I thing is, you can't really know in the blockchain if when someone gives you payment, you don't know if it's a, if it's mixed funds or not. You just know they are funds. If you go to a blockchain and, and you analyze, then you realize that it's probably uh, it's probably mixed funds. But you can also use mixed funds with Bitcoin. Uh, you can have the same problem. Obviously, in fact, we changed the, the name of the coin. It was that coin before. But we, we realize that it cast a shadow on us, and some people got scared. And, and we decided that we wanted a, a cleaner image, even uh, Dark Coin was not a brand tied to that, uh, to, to nefarious activities, but people understood it that way because Dark Markets and Dark Wallet that came after, after us. I mean, the idea, the original idea was uh, going dark, going obscure. But we'll, we'll have to see. I, I, I don't. I expect we people won't have problems. Uh, I think it's it's public ledger. The, the good thing about about us is we have a public ledger. You just can can read it if if someone doesn't want you to read it. And if uh, you're okay, I'm gonna try to connect with uh, with Evan, the developer, for for the difficult questions. Uh, <laughs> in the meantime, it will give me a couple minutes. Uh, if if you want, uh, we have a mobile wallet. The, the Apple wallet is not available yet. It will be in a few weeks. But the Android one is. Uh, if you search in Play Store, Dash Wallet is by Haas Engineering. You can download it. If you download it, uh, I will send you some coin after that. So you can try and play, and play with it. Uh, after the talk, you can come to me and, and I will send you, send you that. So if you, if you excuse me. <laughs> Can you can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Where is he based? He's in Phoenix, in Arizona. Okay. So. Uh, <laughs> You are, you are live now. Okay, I, I, I will move the computer so you see the room. And wow. I've already done the, the present, that one yes. in the end, raising his hand was Richard. And we've already gone through the presentation. I've answered a few easy questions. Now we have tough ones for you. The first one is that I talked about the, the Trim uh, blockchain for a higher scalability. So uh, there was a question about why not, I said that we deleted, we were gonna uh, erase the transactions in the middle and just keep A to E. And I was asked, why keep A, why not just E? So I think it would be good if you could explain a little that, uh, the, 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 the trim blockchain, because I just uh, said a, a couple quick comments because uh, you know I don't really understand these kind of things. So if you explain it, and, and then we can uh, answer that question. Sure, so uh, my, my sound is okay, right? Yeah, uh, it, it, it's fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so the, the general idea of uh, pruning the chain in the, the way that we propose is you have, you have a coin-based transaction, and that's where the, the money originally comes from. And then the coin-base gets split into a target address to a, a payee, and then to a change address, which comes back to you. And then this happens over and over and over again. And it all originates from that one address, which is A. So by um, pruning out all of the stuff in the middle and just getting the, the addresses that have unspent outputs, we, we eliminate a lot of the, uh, the size uh, the storage of the, the actual transactions. But you have to have A because that's the point base itself. Oh, that answers the question. Uh, okay, uh, so next question. 
Dif difficult questions for, for him? Okay, we, we got. Um, so, I guess one of the issues that I, I, I completely understand the anonymity of trying to have your transactions. One of my biggest concerns is the fact that uh, a lot of users that are using, let's say, Dash, I don't know about Dash, but Bitcoin and whatever else, we have a lot of malicious users. If we're looking at trading the, uh, the protection of the greater good versus increased anonymity, there has to be some line there, and I'm not sure what it is, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure people in this room are looking at me like you're crazy, but one of the big issues that I have is, let's say a criminal in the real world, uh, or it, it, not in the virtual world, but in, you know, comes and robs you. There is an opportunity to find out, you know, there is a way to trace back in information that's gathered along the way. But when you're, what you're proposing Dash versus Bitcoin is there is no ledger. Uh, or there is a ledger, but the ledger is, is very, very, very difficult, if not impossible, to trace. How do you balance that, that idea of trading complete anonymity versus the people that are going to prey on the lesser technically savvy people? Did, did you get that? Uh, yeah, yeah. So the, the way I look at this is there's, there's an entry point in the ecosystem. And usually the identity of that person is known at that point. And then once you get your money into the ecosystem, you have a public ledger and all of the transactions that you do are completely available for anyone to look at. And so the where we're getting to with, with technology and, and the Bitcoin ecosystem is where anyone with enough computing power can go through and try to correlate all these addresses and figure out who's doing what and who's transferring money to who and then they can eventually sell that data, which is a gross invasion of privacy. And I would rather give everyone more privacy rather than take it away from everyone because it's really, you can only give it to everybody or you, you have to take it away from everybody with a system like this. And I know that there are going to be things that happen within the ecosystem that are illegal. And you know, this is just part of having rights. We, we have the right to privacy and some people will abuse that. And I, I think that it, there's, there's a fine line to walk, but we have to, we have to acknowledge that we, we want these rights and there's gonna be money like this that is on the internet where everyone can see everything that's going on and I would rather that money have uh, an attribute of privacy for everybody who can. Yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, my, my follow up to that would be, it, it's really defining the difference between protection and privacy and protection being the people who are less gifted. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that you're not going to fall for a phishing or malware scan that could possibly get on your machine and steal your private key, um, but 99% of every, everybody else in the population will. And I guess my concern is, and, and when I'm talking about that fine balance is, how do we protect people that are less sophisticated? Or are we just saying, screw them, who cares? They're, you know, if we can trick them, then who cares about their money? And, and they'll never, you know, they're never going to survive. I, I have to comment about that. And is that the, the criminals already know how to use Bitcoin in an, in, in a, in an anonymous way or private way, uh, much better than the average user. This gives privacy to everyone. Uh, complex systems in which you, you don't have such an easy way to anonymize funds and keep them private. Uh, only give them to those who are gifted that, uh, that don't need your protection. Making things easier gives it back to everyone. If, if we keep them like they are, only the, the truly gifted are able, because right now you can, you can use Bitcoin in a pretty private way. You can, you can do many things to protect your identity, but uh, this way everyone can do it. So you had a question? Uh, I was just, just a general question about the future of um, I was wondering how you saw the future of the cryptocurrency 
uh, diverse, the cryptocurrency world diversifying in terms of all the stuff that's happening in the Bitcoin 2 world and uh, you know, smart contracts and markets and things like that. At the moment, you know, Dash is a sort of pure, occupying the pure currency space. And you know, how do you see it going in the future, way down the line? You know, is, is it, do you see it consolidating and, and staying a pure currency? Or, is it, or do you think you know, it, it, currencies like Dash are going to have to start doing things that are not really to do with a pure currency and have all kinds of bells and whistles and market features and things like that? Um, as, as far as the, the future goes, um, the, the way I see it is in, in the Bitcoin space, Bitcoin's trying to do a, a lot of things. And it's going to be a ledger and it's going to be a data store and it's going to have color points and there's going to be um, stock trading and futures trading and all of these really complicated contracts and all sorts of things. And um, what I, I, I see there, there's, there's a trade-off. If, if you're going to do all of that stuff, you have to store all of it, and then you have to support all of it. So I, I want to block out a, a lot of those features and then use the, the ledger purely as an exchange of value so that it's fast and it's robust for a very small set of things, just, just as digital cash on the internet. And so I, I wanted to make a, a separation there, saying that we're going to try to be better at this small set of things, and they're going to try to be really good at a really large set. And I, I don't think that you can do all of those and be incredibly good at, at the full spectrum of what they're trying to do. More questions? Well, I have one because I'm not sure if I was able to explain it uh, really well. I know it's uh, still a long shot, but if you could explain the idea for a distributed web wallet, I think it would be interesting because I, I wasn't able to. More than a couple okay, of um, broad ideas. So the, the idea for the web wallet is um, the, the master nodes are built on this technology called forums. And basically what you do is mathematically using the proof of work, you, you take a hash and then based on that hash you select a subset of these master nodes. So say 10. And um, for any given transaction within the web wallet, it would select a random 10 master nodes to sign the transaction. And there would be a specialized um, type of address within the, the Dash uh, software where the, the master nodes actually could hold money. And they, they would hold it basically in escrow of the, the users using the web wall. And so any master node, like the, the full set of master nodes controls this as a whole. And it means that uh, like an individual master node can't move money in and out, even a large group of them couldn't do it because you can't determine what that proof of work cache is going to be ahead of time. It takes the entire network of processing to do that. And so what, then what I, what I want to do is you, you make software so that you can move money into this address and then it keeps track of like how much money you have and, and things like that. And then built on top of it, we would have two-factor authentication, which works under a similar model where the, the money is protected with, within, within that master node-based web wallet. And so you, you get something that's incredibly easy to use, that's secure, and uh, with two-factor authentication, and it stays central. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, then I, I guess we are we are done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Evan. I will send you the video yeah. later. See you. Thanks. Bye.